Thanks, Ed. Um, as most of you in the room know, in 2008, the NTRA headed the industry's formation of the Safety and Integrity Alliance. Simply, the alliance was formed as a mechaniz mechanism to create change in the industry, mainly through an accreditation program at the racetracks. Accreditation is based on a code of standards, and many of the standards that we've adopted have been derived over the years from recommendations coming from the Welfare and Safety Summit. Hopefully more to come this year. One of the most positive outcomes of the accreditation process is the sharing of best practices among jurisdictions. What the Alliance accreditation team learns in one jurisdiction shared frequently among others following up. In fact, I've frequently been known to say that today's best practice for some is tomorrow's minimum standard for all. Today you'll hear about some of these best practices by the panelists. This panel is about using data to help keep horses safe. You'll hear today and tomorrow from panelists on this and other panels about the equine injury database and key information gleaned from the data that's been collected. You'll hear about jurisdictional sharing of data collected during the pre-race examination process and the vets list and the data collected to manage racing surfaces. All this data is helping to make racing safer for its participants. It's important though that we recognize that none of these practices by themselves can be described as silver bullets geared toward the instant reduction of catastrophic injuries. However, if we collectively stay the course and continuously attempt to make strong efforts like those you'll hear from these panelists today, we will be successful. Our first panelist this morning is Dr. Lisa Hanel. She's the examining veterinarian from Finger Lakes Racing Association. It's an accredited racetrack. Um, Dr. Hanel likes data analysis, as you'll soon see. Her practical use of the collected data is simply put what we would call best practice. I'll turn it over to Dr. Hanel. Thank you. Okay. You don't let the bad ones go. Um, a trainer said that to me last year, and that's what I try and do every day. That's what I and the other veterinarians that work at Finger Lakes and the examining veterinarians at every racetrack do. Um, and it's a challenge. We work with horses, and horses are, especially young athletic horses, have a propensity for trying hard and sometimes getting themselves into a trouble, and our job is to keep them safe. So let's start. Many of you are familiar with what examining veterinarians do. Um, Finger Lakes is an NTRA accredited racetrack and the veterinarians who work there full time, there are three of us, each one of us performed almost 3,500 pre-race examinations of horses during our season last year. On race days, an official veterinarian examines every horse entered to race, that's hands on, and then we watch the horse dog in hand. We enter our findings into RTO and Compass, and then we hold a daily pre-race meeting where we discuss horses of concern for the day, and our daily goal is zero injuries, and of course, we want zero deaths. We track horses at Finger Lakes in a couple of ways. We use Equibase, we have a virtual stable. We also use some of the reports that are available in Encompass you can look up a horse's entire exam history, which is wonderful. You can, we also track them with internal spreadsheets on a number of measures, and basically there's an awful lot of valuable data which is available to examining veterinarians pre-race, and that's critical, because if you have it pre-race, hopefully you can predict what might be going on with the horse. Though I could relate many anecdotes, it's difficult to prove to a trainer in the moment that the examining veterinarian prevented an injury or a death. According to research done in Florida by Dr. Scalay's group, examining veterinarians do indeed identify many horses who should not be racing on a given day. On average, horses scratched by examining veterinarians take longer to return to racing and they're much more likely to never race again. One fifth of scratched horses never race again, according to that research. Okay, we've all heard about the bad step, and it, it isn't true. It isn't. 
And we know this from necropsy findings because once we started doing necropsies, we found that a lot of these horses had ongoing problems that predisposed them to either re-injuring the original injury or to injuring another body part because the horse was overusing another limb or limbs to compensate for the original injury. That's actually good news because if injuries are not random, both veterinarians and trainers can do a better job of injury prevention, and this is an area where we all need to work together. Now, returning to the topic of effectively using available data to predict injury, there's a lot of data available. Last summer, I read the report um, for the aqueduct fatalities in the inner track. It's available on the New York State Gaming website. And in there, they discuss the risk factors identified by Dr. Parkin for the 2011 Jockey Club Roundtable. And risk factors fall into three general categories, racing history profile, physical characteristics, and race category. So what I did when I was working on the gate in the afternoon is I would take my program and I would risk out every single race, every single horse. You would be probably relieved to hear that I did not make a spreadsheet for each of these horses. <laughs> but if I did, it would look something like this. Um, the numbers across the top, number of horses in the race, risk factors down the side. And this is a race in which a horse was fatally injured. Um, out of an 11 horse field, we had one six, four sevens, and two eights. The fatally injured horse scored seven. So the question is, is this model specific? And my hypothesis is that some of the jockey club risk factors describe a majority of the Finger Lakes horses. We're a blue collar track. We race a lot of claimers. Basically, our typical horse is an older horse who did not race as a two year old, entered in a claiming race, often in a sprint. And when we are talking about specific, um, it's an epidemiology term. Spe specific means that we are excluding horses who are not at risk for, in, for, who are at relatively low risk for injury. Sensitive means that we are identifying horses that are at high risk for injury. So we seem to be identifying a lot of horses who are at relatively high risk, but may not be at the highest risk. Um, so this is the second race in which a horse was fatally injured. If you look along the bottom, you don't have to read the whole thing. The fatally injured horse scored a six. And here's another one. In this one, if you look along the bottom, the fatally injured horse scored a seven. So, Basically, the jockey club risk factors were probably describing a typical Finger Lakes horse. So the next logical question becomes, who were our fatally injured horses? And are the fatally injured Finger Lakes horses typical or atypical of our general population? So our racing secretary and our futurity coordinator pulled some numbers for me. And this is an overview for 2013. We had over 10,000 horse starts. Majority of horses were indeed older horses. About two-thirds of them started in sprints. Three-quarters were claimers. Only 15% were maidens, and that does include special weight and claiming. So Dr. Scalia is going to talk about fatality reviews, um, so I won't really go into that. We started doing them this year, but in 2013, there was just me. We did fatality reports, but we didn't do a formal review. I looked at all of our fatally injured horses' lives in detail. I looked for common risk factors, missed opportunities to prevent deaths. I looked at their racing, ownership, and training histories in Equibase, reviewed their historical pre-race exam findings in RTO and Compass, looked at their history, had they been on a vet's list anywhere. And then I expanded my original spreadsheet, which originally just had the jockey club risk factors and some basic information about trainers and, and riders. And the new and improved sprint sheet looks something like this. This is fake data. Any examining veterinarian at any racetrack can make a spreadsheet for his or her horses. And this is important because the population of horses racing at each racetrack is slightly different. This means the risk factors are probably also slightly different. We will share some things in common, and the jockey club risk factors are indeed important for our horses, but there are other things that are specific to, to ours. You don't have to even use a spreadsheet. You can do this with paper and pencil. 
So, we had 22 racing fatalities last year. This included two accidents, and an accident means that this was controlled by humans, and those are not easily predicted. We had 19 orthopedic deaths and one sudden death. Unfortunately, that was prior to us sending horses to Cornell for necropsy, so we do not know exact cause of death on that horse. That horse is included with the quantitative analysis um, because we basically had 20 high-risk horses not identified pre-race, and we know that they weren't identified because they died. And the question is, were the fatally injured horses typical or atypical? And they were actually quite atypical. So what I did was I looked to see what these horses had in common and create risk groups. And our sample size was much too small for a formal cluster analysis, but I came up with two large high-risk groups that overlap slightly as, long as, as well as a few smaller high-risk groups. These were our risk groups for 2013. Fewer than three starts at Finger Lakes, new horses. Nine out of the 20 had been racing actively somewhere else and then came to us and raced fewer than three times and were catastrophically injured. Maidens, especially in their first nine months of racing, especially if they started as a four or five year old, we lost four horses, two that made their first starts as four year olds, two that made their first starts as five year olds. Sprints, especially short sprints. Even though we ran about two-thirds sprint races, that accounted for 85% of our deaths. And owner-trainer change, and treated in proximity with intraarticular corticosteroids. This is a small group, but it's a very, very dangerous group. If the horse was treated prior to a claim or a private sale, and then new trainer does not know this, or if the new trainer acquires a horse, and then treats it and races it back without performing diagnostics, that's a very dangerous situation. Okay, now for the fun part, I know you're all waiting for the predictive model. These are our five factors for Finger Lakes horses. Three or fewer, few, fewer starts, and I think that the biggest thing with that is they're unfamiliar to their veterinarians, their private veterinarians, they're unfamiliar to the examining veterinarians, and they're unfamiliar to the trainer, especially if the trainer has never worked that horse. And the surface is different. Coming to a different surface does present risk. Not that our surface is a bad surface, we try very hard to make it a good one, but it's different. Change of ownership or trainer, that means it's unfamiliar horse. Significant class drop, we all know about that. Horses that have a history, in the last six months of being on a vet list anywhere, being scratched in the morning, even if that scratch is because the horse colicked or has hives or has a sole abscess or whatever, that means that the lameness or a poor performance or a problem was previously noted by another veterinarian or the trainer. Sometimes we see horses that have a post-race note, horse returned, grade one lame, was not placed on the vet list, but Again, that tells you another veterinarian recognized there's a problem. And the final is being treated with intraarticular corticosteroids. And I don't think, I, what I think this means for our horses, this is a relatively uncommon scenario for our horses. I think it's partly economic. People do not tend to treat their horses unless they really feel they have to. But what that really means is that lameness or poor performance was noted by the trainer and or the private veterinarian treating that horse. We had a very sad situation last year, for example, where we had a horse who broke sesamoids, and when we got the report from the private veterinarian, the horse had had basically everything on both of its front limbs treated. So they were looking for the problem, and unfortunately they did not find it. So this is what I did next. These are the same three races with my risk. And for this race, note the two horses that scored four. One of them is the fatally injured horse. The other horse raced a few lakes, weeks later without incident, then was scratched in the morning by an examining veterinarian, raced back a couple weeks later, and has never raced since. Um, I believe it was placed by one of the groups that places horses off of our backstretch. Um, they do good work. They placed over 200 horses last year. Next. 
fatally injured horse scored a five. The horses scoring four and three, the horse scoring four was scratched by an examining veterinarian. She didn't run. Um, the other horse, scratch three, was scratched by the trainer who said that it colicked. Um, I saw that horse myself a couple weeks later and it is on our vets list and it, it actually will never get off because it's been placed in a private home and it's going for surgery. It never raced with us ever. This is the third. And the important thing about the previous race is you may have multiple horses in a single race who are at high risk. That was a five claiming maiden race sprinting. And those are pretty high risk horses. In this race, the fatally injured horse scored a five. The horse who scored four is actually trained by a relatively conservative trainer. This is the last race that horse ever raced. They placed that horse as a riding horse unacceptably high risk to that trainer. So our revised challenge is how can we make racing safer for horses that are new to Finger Lakes, new to racing, or both? And how can we make racing safer for horses that have experienced a recent change of trainer and or ownership? And these are our target groups, again. And the important thing to emphasizes you still have to go out and examine the horse. It would be wonderful if we could just read our program and say, okay, I'm not going to look at these at all and just train, tell the trainer that they're scratched and they'll certainly understand because we have these wonderful statistical models. You can't do that. You have to go look at them. And trainers themselves have the power to make a horse higher risk or lower risk, depending on their practices and their knowledge and their familiarity of the horse. Also, a horse that is low risk on paper may present lame or with a problem in the morning because they're horses. This is a great book, um, and this talks about checklists. This was written by a human surgeon at Harvard, and he developed a checklist based on what pilots do prior to flying out. And he said it, it helps you not forget the basic things. And a difficult situation is something any examin examining veterinarian can appreciate. It's very, very difficult. These are emotional decisions, whether you've got a horse that's racing in big race. For us, those are usually allowance, but sometimes stakes races where the stakes are relatively high. Or if it's a fellow who may only have two horses and he's been working for months to try and get this horse to race, and it's a very emotional decision. But if the horse isn't right, the trainer's going to lose his investment, and that's that's an economic reality, but the truth is we all lose when horses are catastrophically injured. It's, it's a terrible thing. And a good risk model, you can have it in your mind, it's subjective. So what do we do this year? Um, it's pretty tough to work off our vets list this year. We, um, a number of the horses on our vets list have been placed, they've been sent to be broodmares, they're going to be riding horses, and the good thing is they didn't go out there and run with a rider on their back, which means that hopefully they didn't sustain a career-ending injury. A lot of them will do very well, they just can't race. And we monitor horses and we initiate conversations with trainers and talk to them and say, what do you know about this horse? How long have you had him? How's he working for you? How's he coming back? We do a lot of past performance research. You'll see the three of us looking up horses on the computer, making notes before we go out in the barn area, which helps us prompt questions. And that's really great because the trainers, most of them are very generous with what they know, and we do learn from them too. And talking to trainers about risk, a lot of them know about risk. I started making this model partly because trainers told me we know what horses break down here, Doc. They're, they've only raced here two or three times, and then they, then they just break down. And they were right and they were wrong. And looking at that quantitatively has really helped um, us in our jobs. We're working on continuing education. We've, we're planning one on wise acquisition of horses. Any trainer can walk into our racing office at any time and see what horses are currently on the vet list. Obviously, if they're on the vet's list, they're not racing, which means that they're not going to be claimed, but we have a lot of private sales between trainers because I cannot tell you how many times a trainer will acquire a new horse and then they find out the horse is on the vet's list, and it's a very difficult situation. But now they can go into the racing office, and we're happy to look that up. 
and reduce risk. And this is a quote, this is by a Finger Lakes trainer who was interviewed a few years ago. How, how can you ever get used to that? Um, you don't get used to it. Nobody wants to see a horse catastrophically injured. So for examining veterinarians, the bottom line is anyone can do this. It, it's not anything special. Make a spreadsheet and look at your horses and identify your high-risk cl clusters of horses. And you probably need to reevaluate this regularly. If you're year-round racing, probably every other year. If you race a short season, every year. And look and see, are your horses, first of all, evenly distributed through your general population, or are they clustered? If they're evenly distributed through your general population and you have a low fatality rate, keep doing what you're doing and try to keep improving because the goal is zero. If they're clustered, keep doing what you're doing with everybody and then focus on the ones that are clustered. And again, this is probably racetrack specific. The racehorse population is different. We don't run the same horses that run here at Keeneland at Finger Lakes. Um, the trainer population and culture is different at different tracks. At our racetrack, many of the trainers were all trained with the same fellow, who's a wonderful horseman. And private veterinarians, we have a very small number of private veterinarians, and they work well, and they're fairly opening with, open with the examining veterinarians. And one would hope that would always be the case. But the culture can be different. And the track surface can be different, um, again, you, no one would like to say that the track surface is a problem, but every track is a little bit different and that can predispose horses to slightly different injuries. If you have a deep track, you're gonna see more soft tissue injuries. If your track's hard, you're gonna see other things. So other groups of interest, because I am very interested in looking at some other things, horses that have been in consecutive months of active race training, I think that it's probably gonna come at about the nine to 18 month horse that's been in active training. That seems to be what we see. We have more problems with horses that have been racing continuously through the winter earlier in the summer versus horses who have had the entire winter off and just raced the Finger Lakes season, which is April to December, and then generally have the, have the winter off. And in Too Tough, we see a lot of horses who start out their careers, and you can see from their performance that they're very outclassed. and. When you're running really hard against horses that are much bigger and stronger and faster than you are, you're gonna predispose yourself to injury. And if anyone has any questions, I'd just like to thank a few people. Um, and that's about it. Everybody's got note cards in front of them in the cup holders if there are any questions throughout the day. If you'd like to write them on there, then we can ask, but I'll open this up at this point for any questions. Any of the panelists have anything to ask or add? I'm just, my first, I have a question. I'm curious, how have the results been thus far this year as you've instituted these new It's protocols? too early. It's too early in the year to say how we're going to do for the entire year as a fatality rate. I can tell you we definitely have a high number of horses that were identified and not allowed to run based on examining veterinarians, observing the horses lame in the morning. Um, I can tell you about one specific one. This was a horse I saw personally. And the horse was a classic poor mover. Um, sometimes poor movers are poor movers because they have poor conformation and they just travel poorly. Sometimes they're poor movers because they're lame on multiple limbs. This horse, when she jogged away, she didn't look great, but there was no identifiable head nod, but when she slowed down at the end, she would go lame on the right front. Then they'd spin her to the left, and the first two steps would be lame on the left front. And I scratched the horse. We actually sat down with the trainer and talked about it, because the horse also had some effusion and some pain on one of the knees, the right knee, as it happened. And I had all of the results from this horse's previous exam findings for the entire nine months, I think, that the horse had been racing, six to nine months, something like that. And all of the results mentioned left knee, left knee, left knee, left knee. So the trainer and I kind of agreed to disagree, but he was willing to trust me to his credit, and he radiographed the knees. She had multiple chips in both knees, and she had a fracture line in that right knee. She was gonna slab. 
And she, to his credit, he found a very good home for her. And she's not running. And that horse never ran with us. The horse came from another racetrack. So. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank and you. Take care.